Dr. Aditya Kelkar is already here, who's the co-chairman. Dr. Bharti Kashyap, if she's here. Uh, the moderators are Dr. Chitra Ramuti, Dr. Anaga Hiru, and uh, Dr. Srinivas M. Joshi. Our panelists are Dr. Satyajit Sinha, Dr. Harshul Tak, and Dr. Rohit Saxena. And we have uh, our judges here who will be marking the evaluation. So is the first uh, presenter here, Dr. Neeraj Israni? Yeah, it's, it is loaded and excellent. So uh, for the judges, there are five uh, subdivisions, the entire marking is out of 100. And obviously it's self-explanatory what you need to mark for 20 marks each. Uh, in, uh, please don't leave any column blank if you're evaluating. If there's any conflict of interest, you can just strike that off and just say conflict of interest. And uh, hopefully we'll have a wonderful session. So I'm very happy to see that our moderator is here. May I just introduce the first talk so we'll be on time. Yeah. So Dr. Neeraj Israni is going to present his innovation on something he's called storm. I hope it's not desert storm or something like that. So, but it's instead it's a slit lamp assisted toric marker. Good morning. So uh, my topic is slit lamp assisted toric marker. The authors have no financial interest in this presentation. Presenting to you a novel patent pending slit lamp based toric marker. There have been various innovations in access marking, right from the anterior stromal puncture, the pendulum marker, and the bubble marker. On the other hand, automated markers such as the Varion, the application based marking, and the Callisto image guided system are also there, but however, they are very expensive. Manual handheld toric markers invariably give us a picture like this, which is completely off the axis. So we had a research question. Can we actually innovate an economical, accurate, stable and easy to use toric marker? We took inspiration from the Goldman's Applination Tonometer, which goes and indents the cornea of the patient and the patient is not hesitant at all. We decided to use the calibration slot, which is universal in every slit lamp, for our slit lamp based toric marker. This was the first hand drawn diagram of our toric marker. We further started doing 3D printed models. As you can see, the 3D printed models became bulkier every time. Thus, we finally settled with a shaft within a shaft that is the IV stand design. Now, Coming to the first prototype of our device. As you can see, we have implanted it into the calibration slot of the slit lamp. With the help of the knob of the slit lamp, we move it ahead. It goes and indents the cornea at the desirable axis. Again with the knob, we take the slit lamp behind and it comes back to its original position. Now, the final prototype consists of a dial with a shaft made out of stainless steel. The dial is rotatable 360 degrees and has a atraumatic edge. On the other hand, the adapter or the body of the toric marker is along with a plate to accommodate a levelometer called as the bullseye levelometer. This bullseye levelometer makes sure that the toric marker is perpendicular to the table of the slit lamp. Storm is now published in Indian Patent Journal and is in the final stage of hearing as long as the patent is concerned. Thanks to Epsilon USA, we have now come up with the final product. As you can see, the final product is made out of extremely lightweight aluminum and the marker is made out of titanium with very precise and sharp edges. The same procedure is done again where the marker is placed into the calibration slot. The bubble marker makes sure that the storm is perpendicular to the slit lamp table. The toric marker is then fixed using the screw as you can see and with the help of the knob of the slit lamp, the marker can be taken ahead or behind 
and as you can see we mark the toric marker using the blue ball pen and the eye is indented beautifully and the patient is very comfortable as seen over here this is how the marks appear on the eye it not only leaves a mark but also slightly indents the cornea at that particular axis thank you <clears throat> we have yes i told the judge yeah good morning dr niraj hi Excellent. sir good morning uh, excellent presentation thank you so much and uh, only thing is uh, i just wanted to know we need to apply topical drops because yes. otherwise it will be painful yes. so and the uh, markings that are done hmm. it's possible just like uh, when we apply net patient has slight hesitation slight movement yes. would be there so maybe that is when the oh, slit lamp it. comes into play sir because the patient is much more comfortable we can also strap the band we can make sure that the lateral canthus is aligning with the uh, slot of the slit lamp and uh, normally when we mark with a needle the patient is a little scared yeah. so in this case also uh, like you said a drop of paracaine just a slight bro elevation yeah. and uh, we don't even need to use because now what epsilon has come up with uh, is a much smaller dial Okay, so fine. it goes and marks, and the, the atraumatic edge is pretty much ahead. So it actually goes and just touches the eye, and slightly indents the cornea also. Yeah, that I agree with your principle. My concern is there may be a variation of maybe two three degrees that would be there. Patient could move still. He yes. Has some uh, still, yeah. I I have done a study and compared it with Varion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there is a two degree, a two point zero seven degree least there. deviation. Yeah. But still, as comparable to a uh, anterior stromal puncture or a ball pen marker, the ball pen marker leaves a very thick mark. So that itself leaves a three degree or two and a half degree variation. Yeah. So otherwise, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Good Thank device. You. And uh, has it been? Uh, I mean, uh, you have now. The prototype as well as the one ready for sale. So it's the final. It's available at the it's stall. It's there, available. Yeah. And yeah. in addition to you, are other people also uh, using it? I mean, do you have uh, some other? Yes, I have sent it to. Yeah. I have sent it to three very speaker? high volume, high volume surgeons. Okay. And uh, we are collecting me? a case series for around 300, 400 patients, which will be published very soon. So far, what has been the experience of? They are very happy. Uh, there is one high volume surgeon in Jalgaon who is operating and. Uses this almost in all his toric cases, and his results are very good. Very sorry, thank you very yeah, much. Congratulations, thank I, you, man. I, Thanks. I really would be obliged. We stick very uh, strictly to the time because in that manner, we then only will be ready to go for the uh, GBF. They'll close all the halls. So exactly two minutes. Sorry, judges. So the, our next speaker is Dr. Panda, and uh, going to talk about BST Glide, which is a DCR surgeon's delight. First of all, for us, DCR is not a delight, but good good to see that you're making it delightful for us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'll be discussing about my surgical innovation, the BST Glide, which will become a DCR surgeon's delight, actually. So I don't have any conflict of interest or any financial disclosures. So as we all know that uh, the bicanalicular silicone intubation is widely used during lacrimal surgeries all over the world, including external DCR and endonasal DCR. The indications are as described. And this silicone tube placement, it aims at maintaining the anastomotic patency and stability of the canalicular epithelium. But the problem is retrieving the metal probes while doing the, do, uh, doing the DCR is the difficulty part. And this procedure may be traumatic. So there is a need of a tube inserter which would make our life easier. So as rightly said, necessity is the mother of invention. So we have invented this uh, BST glide uh, from the idea that uh, from the back of a spoon, we can, it's like the back of a spoon. So uh, it can be introduced into the nose uh, after creating the lacrimal sac flaps and the, nas uh, and the nasal mucosal flaps. So uh, the precautions to be taken is that the punctum should be well dilated at the start of insertion of, uh, with the punctum dilator and the tip of the glide should be visible at the ostium. 
So this is how the technique of insertion of the slide. So we have done a pilot study to compare the outcomes of this novel BST glide versus the conventional technique of intubation during external DCR. Uh, we had a sample size of 100 eyes and the routine steps of external DCR were performed. And uh, the patients were divided into two groups, uh, 50 number in each group. And uh, uh, the inclusion criteria were a primary nasolacrimal duct obstruction if the intraoperative flap damage was there or canalicular trauma was there or distal can or can common canalicular obstruction. The outcome measures were uh, mean intubation time and the total surgical duration and the intraoperative and the postoperative pain scores. So the results showed that there is a significantly less time uh, uh, used in uh, this uh, using the BST glide and the mean surgical duration is also very less and the mean intraoperative pain score is significantly lesser than the conventional method. So various sets and methods have been described for lacrimal intubation. However, the disadvantages are the difficulty in retrieving the probe and uh, the relative expense of these probes, which uh, uh, in, in, a, in developing country as ours. So uh, our tube inserter is smooth through which the metal probe can glide easily. It is very cheap and no chance of false passages there. It is, it is technically very easy. It is a very simple glide and there are no complications so far. So to conclude, our glide is a novel, economical, and efficient method of VST insertion during DCR. It can also be used in revision DCR, secondary acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction, and endonasal DCR. Thank you. A really an excellent uh, presentation and a very good innovation, I must say. But my question is uh, about the different sizes and the ostium size of the patient. Do you have uh, different sizes of the glide? No, no, it is a, so a single. Can that be used in a pediatric patient? Yes, sir. Greetings, everyone. In this video, it's we around aim to the size. Uh, it is made for adult size only, but it is uh, it is also done in pediatric DCS. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. We discussed. I missed it. Next, okay. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm breaking the queue. Uh, uh, Shuti has a course. Uh, so she would be presenting, and what's your? So judges, please note this is Dr. Shruti at number ten. She is presenting on Lumino Sundial, a device to prevent myopia progression. Please name in your uh, marking list. Okay. So I would be obliged. Uh, 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 who's the discussant in that? not mentioned in the final paper which we just got now. Uh, Dr. Madhukar, can you take care of that? Uh, thank you so much for considering me. I had another instruction course, so I appreciate being pushed. Sorry about the inconvenience. So, uh, so this is a beautiful view of a uh, scenery, but imagine if you're viewing the world like this. Now, this is myopia, the inconvenient truth, and 50% of the world is actually going to be seeing the world blurry in the, by 2050. Now, if you think it's just the world, imagine in India, there is studies that indicate that another, by 2050, we are going to have almost 50% of our Indian population becoming myopic. So the problem is serious, but the solution is simple, and it is sunlight. There are several studies on sunlight that show that there's a pre preventive and a protective effect of sunlight just by two hours a day. But the problem lies in that we don't know what are the protective factors in outdoors. Is it the sunlight? Is it looking far? Is it the outdoors? 
and our question is the only way like they are limiting factor because they just have recall value but no objective measurement and the third is how can we promote outdoor activity to the parent and child now to answer all of these questions we innovated with a new device called the lumino sundial now this is a device which has a dynamic sunlight monitoring in the child it can be worn on the wrist and on the id card and it has a, a ambient light sensor on the top as you can see here and this light sensor picks up the sunlight measurement of the child on a dynamic basis now what is the kind of data that we can harvest from this the illuminance levels based on the lux the uv exposure the uv index the infrared exposure the physical activity in terms of steps or accelerometer the heart rate of the child the ambient temperature that the child is being exposed to and using all this we created an algorithm to calculate the overall outdoor time so here every measurement is taken a uh, measurement is taken every 5 seconds and computed so that one hour 60 readings are taken to give the average sunlight exposure of the child now this data is fed into a mobile phone application that the parent can actually see real time and see how much of exposure the child is actually having throughout the day and most parents are working so they would really appreciate this and they can actually set goals for their child as well the first step of the study was to validate the device against a standard luxometer and we saw the reliability of 0.7 which is good we also compared the different settings of the device outdoor sunlight outdoor shade indoor natural illumination and indoor artificial light we found statistically significant difference between the, all the four situations we also found that outdoor shade and indoor natural illumination showed a little bit of similar readings so sitting next to a window is probably really good for the child as equal to sitting under a canopy we also found that 1000 lux is considered arbitrarily as outside and inside but in our readings we found even outdoors was less than 1000 and indoors were more than 1000 in some settings so we decided we needed more reliable readings for this and we put all of the information that we had collected from the devices into machine learning and using ai we had found an accuracy of 67% so now the device is loaded with real time data we then went ahead and did a one week compliance study and wearability study and we found compliance of 83% and feedback was excellent and the time spent outdoors was 1.2 hours in the holidays and 38 minutes in the school days now following this we also did a one almost one month study and here if you look at this the average uv exposure of 10 children was 0.65 indoors whereas it was 4 almost outdoors so the learnings from our study was that we validated it we found uv is a better predictor standing near a window is similar to standing under a canopy and device can predict 93.7 7%. We also now currently having European studies in parallel with the Erasmus group in Rotterdam to see how the climate change actually affects the devices readings. So to put it in a nutshell, Lumino sundial is a reliable measurement of sunlight exposure. It can be a pivotal research tool and it actually helps the clinician to customize myopia control for each child and it is actually a good feedback uh, mechanism for the parent and child to promote. Thank you so much. This is me when i was a child and these are my children today sitting in front of the laptop i think we need to change this paradigm today thank you so much wonderful dr madhukar yeah i think that's a great tool to know what's happening and uh, as of now we don't know uh, what are the uh, factors yes, which are promoting myopia yes and it's a wonderful study and congratulations thank you sir yeah. thank you Dr. Shruti, have you applied for a patent or anything like that? Yes, yes, madam. So as we speak, yesterday was the hearing of the patent, and uh, the result would come in a few days. But we have applied for the patent. When you apply for the patent, can you present it elsewhere? I don't know. Yesterday in the hall, there was a discussion. If you apply for something, you can present it. So it's pending. Patent she is can pending. Accept. She can present it, and she owns the patent, so she can still yeah. present it. Very powerful last slide. Yes, very powerful. Thank you so yeah. much. So we want. Thank you for considering again. Thank you. May I now invite Dr. Arvind Kumar Maurya? So he'll be presenting about his technique for sewing needle uh, micro capsule tome. Greetings, everyone. In discussion for him is yes, Dr. Rostagi. Thank you. This video we aim to demonstrate our new and effective innovation sewing needle micro capsule tome to avert Argentinian flag sign during capsule access in patients with intimacy. In this video, we aim.
प्लीज वॉट हैपन वॉल्यूम प्लीज या डोंट स्टार्ट द टाइम टिल यू गेट वॉल्यूम to demonstrate our new and effective in greetings every even in this video we aim to demonstrate our new and effective innovation serving needle master capsule tone to increase the volume of flag sign during capsular access in patients with intermittent pearly white mature cataracts Argentinian flag sign is a complication during capsular access in intermittent white cataracts which typically arises instantly after initial break by sharp hypodermic needle it is known that raised internal ventricular pressure is responsible for propagation of the initial break into a radial tear to counter this several techniques including a small needle aspiration technique have been described but the peripheral extension of the capsular tear as is still seen instantly after pricking the capsule with hypodermic needle even before the aspiration of cortex so other factor that is a linear cut configuration with discontinuous open edges with the needle are responsible too the disruptive forces act along the axis of the linear curve so the tear always extend radially along the open margins of the cut but never perpendicular so we came up with a hypothesis that if we are able to manually create an opening in the anterior capsule with a round regular configuration like a capsulotomy with round continuous circular edge without any discontinuity hence do not tear away with a sudden outburst of the anterior lateral fluid to prick the capsule we developed a novel instrument sewing needle microcapsulotomy with round pointed tip like a sewing needle system tip is approximately 0.75 mm in length 0.6 mm in diameter and angled at 90 degree to the distal shaft on puncture in the capsule it creates a round hole opening with a smooth margin unlike the linear cut produced by the sharp needle after proper visco in the ac through the main incision the sewing needle microcapsulotomy is inserted tip of the needle is placed vertically over the center of the capsule tip is then moved downward to penetrate through the taut anterior capsule round pointed tip creates a round opening with a smooth margins at the center of the capsule pressurized internal ventricular fluid gushes out as a volcanic eruption through the hole which decreases the internal ventricular pressure and helps in the decompression of the capsular bag evacuation of the internal ventricular fluid including the posterior compartment fluid is achieved by tapping the capsule posteriorly again cohesive visco is pushed in ac to flatten the anterior capsule and intended 5 to 5.5 mm of capsular access is initiated after tearing the central hole using a rexus forceps and easily completed without the risk of peripheral extension to conclude sewing needle microcapsulotomy with circular round hole puncture of the anterior capsule along with pressure decompression is the simplest of technique which enables us to successfully prevent azetinian flag sign sewing needle microcapsulotomy is simple yet highly effective novel tool and is an ideal device to open up tense anterior capsule to adequately decompress the bag prior to the initiation of the capsular access thank you thank you thank you yeah uh, dr mori any clinical trials for this yeah we are doing it uh, we are comparing it with the uh, this uh, simple needle aspiration so right now we have done 23 cases in both the groups so there is no extension uh, in this sewing needle microcapsulotomy but two cases in the small needle aspiration were noted any, but the sample size is very large so it's uh, too early to say any any but, other uh, trial with any other method of uh, yeah doing? we can do we can do with zapto or with flac also and has uh, to check the cost effectiveness of this technique because uh, it it's uh, hardly uh, costing anything is it clear commercially available yeah it is available with epsilon and uh, have you applied for the trade uh, this uh, mark patent yeah yeah it's under pending pending yeah right it's pending yeah thank you thank you thank you so Very much good. dr morya thank, thank you so much we'd like to now invite the next speaker dr alok sati he'd be speaking to us on permislet and innovative technique and the discussant is dr madhukar reddy the next speaker dr sayantan ghosh are you there is he there dr sayantan ghosh a very good dr morning. shafina a very good morning to everyone uh, greetings from my hospital uh, the topic is sterigium extended removal followed by 
minor ipsilateral simple limb epithelial transplantation. That's a new term which we have coined as a Fermi slit. We have done this procedure in recurrent erygium patients and how the thought provoked is we got 61 years old female with recurrent erygium and with semiflurane and she was operated twice with excision and the conjunctival autograft elsewhere and also she is a known patient of primary open angle glaucoma. Now is there any answer for this? Yes, we looked into the literature because she was quite adamant that she doesn't want any further surgery and also we should not forget that she is a patient of primary open angle glaucoma too. So we reviewed the literature and we found a technique which can offer her zero recurrence rate and that's what came to us as a perfect technique and uh, we further reviewed the literature and we found that uh, there has been just one recurrence out of 1000 patients in a series by Dr. Hurst and in recurrent erygium there was no complications, there was no recurrence. So we were quite uh, happy with this technique and we thought of emulating this in our patient but can we do it in our patient who is already having a primary open angle glaucoma with poor follow-up? Of course not. So we thought of modifying this perfect technique to the Permi slit. Here in what we do, we have taken per from perfect, that is we have done the extensive pterygium removal, but instead of doing, uh, instead of placing the conjunctival autograph, because that's a large autograph has to be placed, we thought of doing the mini slit over there. So this is the uh, surgical video for this. We often take it from the, you know, head end, though there are different ways of doing it. And you can see uh, the severity of uh, the simpliferon formation. So we have to release the simpliferon. And this is the subconjunctival tissue, which we have to cut and after cutting it, then we have done per of perfect, that is the pterygium extended removal, where we have to remove the entire uh, subfibrous tissue. Basically, we all know that the tenon is the source of further recurrence. And this is, uh, we have to clear the medial rectus all around with the fibrous tissue because that's the what is the source of further recurrence. And that's the bas basic concept in the perfect technique. And uh, we have to remove the conjunctiva, we have to remove uh, the tenon up to up till the medial canthus. And once we have done that, uh, we have done the phonicil uh, forming suture. And once the phonics has been formed, now you can see that it's very clear medial rectus. Now we will be placing the amniotic membrane over it, followed by uh, the mini slit procedure where we have taken uh, a piece of limbal tissue from superior uh, temporal aspect. We split it into four and we place it at the limbus uh, and made it adhere over there by the fibrin glue. Followed by placement of bandage contact lens. So this is what the follow-up as a day one, day seven, one month, and six month. There is no recurrence, no semiferon, good cosmesis, no ocular restrictions, and of course, our purpose is solved. We have preserved the conjunctiva for future glaucoma surgery. So we started our journey from here and landed up here. So there is no restrictions. So we have done a couple of other patients with a very beautiful outcome, I should say. So it's the evolution of the thought process which has led to this innovative procedure. And the, we have combined most of the pros into it, like we have done the complete and extensive removal of pathology. We have preserved the conjunctiva. We have got the anti-inflammatory effect of the amniotic membrane and we have achieved the replacement of pathological stem cells with the normal stem cells. Though nothing can be avoided, but what's the most satisfying is that there's no recurrence, no simpliferon, and most important is that we have preserved the conjunctiva for future surgery. So take home message is that it's a promising technique. It has the ability to change the practice pattern. And of course, we require large cohort to finally conclude our results. Thank you for your patience. Very logical. But have you tried it for more extensive pterygium, which 
yeah or like the, bilateral terry gym like that uh the terry gym which i showed in the video is i yeah. think it's one of the most extensive only yes, which yes. has involved you know a yeah. lot of assembly for all yeah, and all yeah, that yeah. we have what i think what you're asking is can can we do it with a double headed yes terry exactly yes, i'm sorry I yeah i remember that yeah, yeah yeah there also we have done in the you've done okay thank you डॉक्टरफुलरे Yes. most of us do not know and it is the tenon which is you know the inciting factor for it so if you are removing it definitely we are taking care of the future recurrence. and we need to follow up the patients longer because 6 months is too short a time to uh, know sir, the actual uh, recurrence yeah, if we look into the uh, literature uh, most of the recurrences have occurred within first 3 months so i think uh, logistically 6 months is adequate sir okay thank you very much thank you sir. we go on So, so we are uh, back to the to our track. So the next speaker is Dr. Sa. No, uh, Dr. Sainthan Ghosh is not here. Okay. And Dr. Shafina is also not here. So oh. Dr. Atul. So Dr. Atul Putalat is going to talk about 3D printed LAG lens attachment guard, a novel protection system for lenses used in ophthalmology. <laughs> so the discussant dr anand saxena is dr anand saxena yeah he has two talks one after the other right dr atul can you also anna so what has happened is who are the two people who are not there those two good morning everyone um, i just want you all to uh, do an exercise with me kindly take all of your phone out and if you turn it around what do you see do you see a protective case or cover most of your phones are protected because they are expensive you want to keep them safe right so what about your lenses what you use in ophthal day in and day out do you want to protect them so i will talk to you about lag lens attachment guard it is a 3d printed lag series a novel protection system for ophthalmological lenses so how did this idea come to me so in our la retina laser clinic the prp lenses which cause an immense amount it breaks it because if it falls and gets in contact with the ground so it can either slip from the surgeon's hand or some of the patients are really uncooperative you know you have to laser if you don't have a multi spot your single spot will take time and patients will get restless and the lens can fall it has happened to multiple fellows in our center so i was thinking how can i prevent this from happening so uh, i thought to myself how about we give some soft flooring on the floor so that there is some cushioning so some uh, the instruments department helped us in covering the broken areas with m seal to try and use on cornea but that is not cornea friendly it's not because it, m seal is not uh, biologically um, acceptable so we wanted something something a better solution so we decided to design and 3d print a new guard and then we wanted it to be mounted onto the slit lamp and then we went on to the prototype and then testing it so if i'm printing or doing something i wanted it to hold the lens firmly it should be easy to attach and detach from the lens should not interfere with the corneal contact region should be attached to the slit lamp or maybe to the wrist of the person who is giving the laser and obviously it shouldn't be a hindrance to the working or viewing area and definitely it should be low cost with these points in mind we cad designed and then we printed our first prototype using a 3d printer during hackathon 2.0 which happened last year using tpu thermoplastic polyurethane and this is the final uh, the first prototype that you see here it has a winding clip a thread lock and a lens holder this is uh, the lens hanging from the center of the forehead uh, support of a pascal slit lamp so let's look at how it is set up so you can you take your lens guard and then you fix your uh, prp i am showing a pr mainster 165 lens the most commonly used uh, prp lens in our in uh, most of the laser clinics so once it is uh, fixed inside then you can uh, using a cable tie you can just mount it there and then um, apply the laser so since uh, you might you might have noticed in the first prototype the footprint was large it was a slightly bulkier so now we have gone to make 
PRP lag 2.0, which you can see in this image. It's very, very thinner footprint. And we have uh, tried making it in silicon material also, which is similar to our silicon phone cases. Um, and also we thought, you know, why don't we make it for all kind of lenses? You know, we want to, some people will have a high volume setup in a large center. We want the lenses to last for a long time and we want it adequate protection. You don't want it to fall down. So we designed it for 90D and 20D as well. And now, why, why don't we, so we thought, why, why don't we give it more color, make, make it more acceptable to all kind of audience. Maybe you can engrave your name onto the case. So we gave it many aesthetic variations as well. Now we are also making it for gonioscopes as well, so that you know the gonioscope can hang from the slit lamp and doesn't fall down on the floor. Because this will definitely be a boon. I, I know not for an expert person who's been in the OPD maybe for a number of years, for the PGs who with their hard-earned stipend might be buying a lens or two and they don't want it breaking. And uh, people might refuse it. If a senior comes to you, ask your 20D, you obviously have to give it. And you expect it to be protected and not uh, you know damaged uh, by the thing. So, Thank you. We might have the woman wanting one for each dress also. You never know. <laughs> it's a nice, a nice presentation and good thought. Yes. But tell me one thing. You have uh, met for the 20 adapter lenses also. Yes. And uh, so many times we have to use uh, in the operation theater. So how to sterilize it? No, sir. This is only for the OPD, sir. That is not for the operation not, theater. Not, not, this not is the one OPD. point that we cannot sterilize it. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. And second thing, how the how much is the grip in these lenses? Because the, I have seen the surface is very smooth. Yes, sir. The, we are giving it a grippy, like your uh, cricket bat grip. Okay. So, we are giving it a... But a so far, it's a, uh, as you have shown, it is a very... Yes, sir. This is the prototype we have. I am working with Aurolab now. We have gone to the third prototype now. So, soon we will be printing it in silicon with a proper grip. And we'll also be doing a drop test also. Like when new phones come out, they will do a drop mm -hmm. test to see how the case is protecting. So we are requiring more lenses to do a drop test to see how it withstands the stock. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. So next we have Dr. Atul Singh, please. Okay, Dr. Atul, can, you have, can we have your next talk? Yeah. So this is about intraocular diathermy for retinal surgeries. Yes. Don't don't start the timer, please. Please restart from the beginning. Is there volume in this? Is Dr. Atul, is there volume in it? No, no, I'm okay. Not. Right. Please go ahead, start it, please. Timer should be changed, no? Uh, this is a typical uh, advanced uh, diabetic vitrectomy case that you see here. So uh, my uh, sir is uh, dissecting the membrane. I was the assisting surgeon. So I was observing, he was dissecting the membrane, it started bleeding. He took out his uh, cutter, he introduced a cautery inside and he tried to cauterize the bleed. So he's cauterizing it and at the same time trying to dissect it a bit. So as you can see, the bleeder has been cauterized and he took out the, cauter uh, the cautery outside and came back in. By the time he came back in, the bleeding profuse, it was bleeding from some other side or from the same side, we don't know. But then the entire field is filled with blood. So this is what happens in a typical advanced diabetic vitrectomy when you do. So I thought to myself, how, how could I have helped my sir in avoiding this? Can I do something? Can I do something to prevent this from happening? So I, with that idea in mind, I did, decided to develop an intraocular diathermy instrument, a challenge that we overcome in vitreoretinal surgery, IDI. So let's uh, look at the existing scenario. The conventional diathermy probe is point shaped. The surgeon must push on the blood vessel with a probe to close it and then coagulate it. High energy levels are needed to coagulate the distal blood vessel leading to collateral damage. And tip of the diathermy probe can block the surgeon's view. And there is always, like you saw in the, sim the video a while ago, there is a delay between the removal of that instrument, then introduction of the next instrument, and then cauterizing the bleeder. So this in excessive bleeding prevents people from you know, doing a good advanced uh, diabetic vitrectomy procedure. Sorry. 
So with these ideas in mind, I thought to myself, how can I combine a membrane peeling forceps with diathermy? Can I give a membrane peeling forceps the ability to cauterize, diathermize? So with this idea in mind, after some brainstorming, so we wanted an instrument that can apply mechanical pressure from both the sides. So if I have a membrane, I want to apply mechanical pressure from both the sides. It should diathermize the membrane and also I should be able to peel it off. So all these three things happens in tandem in a go. So we wanted a similar instrument. So with this, we wanted the instrument to be conductive, but we did not want the heat to be dissipated in the shaft, only at the tip, good temper and hardness and can be operated with a foot switch. So I don't want it cauterizing every time I hold a membrane. I want it cauterizing when I want it to. So I will have a separate foot switch for it to cauterize. But the ability to close the prong, it will be on the handle. So with this idea in mind, we developed the first prototype uh, with the assistance of uh, Chennai Surgicals. So as you can see in the image, uh, the round cross section at the top. So it has a inner cylinder and an outer cylinder. The outer cylinder is connected to one pole of the um, cautery and is connected to uh, is connected to one prong of the forceps. The inner cylinder is connected to the other prong and to the next pole of the cautery. So what happens is when these two prongs come in contact, the electric circuit is completed and the tip of it cauterizes. But both the cylinders are insulated by an insulation material. So, so that there is no conduction elsewhere, but at the tip. Now we have developed it in 20 gauge and uh, this is a push button system in which the button is pressed so that the forceps comes and closes the, uh, the membrane and you have a foot switch which will be uh, giving the cauterizing ability. So now we are going on to make the 23 and 24 gauge instrument because we don't want to go forward with 20 gauge because 20 gauge is the era has passed. So now we are working on this. And as you can see in the video below, we are now also working on combining endo light with endo laser. Usually what happens is you, when you laser uh, the retina, you need a separate port. Thank you. Nice. Very nice. I think it's, it's quite, uh, quite innovative. Thank you, sir. My question was that once you are uh, pressing on that uh, knob to uh, close the forceps, our, our usual uh, hand working is to, 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 yes, to just work like a forceps kind of thing. Yes. So how would that uh, a, a push button help in? So the 20 gauge yeah. is made just with the push button. Uh, the, the 23 and 25 gauge, we are making a 360 degree uh, pressing mechanism just as we have in the Alcon Grease Haber or the shark skin forceps, which we have a 360 degree uh, grasping mechanism, which all the retina surgeons use. So that has not been developed yet. No, the the, the, grip, the, the grip switch process. is already the, no, the grip switch is already there, sir. We just have to combine it because okay. it's a prototype. The switch making is an expensive process. So we, the prototype we just went with the because the resources are limited. We don't want to waste resources. So okay, very nice. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you Doctor Atul. Excellent. Uh, we go to another Doctor Atul, Doctor Atul Singh. And he's going to present shield your slit lamp with a face shield. The discussant is. Uh, so efficacy of breast shield in uh, preventing contamination is already well uh, well established. Various research has been done. So there are very kinds of ty types of materials are used like uh, PVC shield, A3 size laminated from the both side. Someone has used the X-ray film material. There are a lot of do it your breast shields are available. So my innovation was using a simple face shield as a slit lamp barrier. So this is the video. Morning everyone. To use face shield as a slit lamp barrier, first we remove the protective film from either side of the face shield. Now face shield is cleaned with the isopropyl alcohol swab to remove any residual gum and for disinfectant and is also dried with the clean sterile gauch piece. Next the elastic band of the face shield on one side is cut and face shield is molded on the forehead rest. One side of the face shield is tied with the one side of the slit lamp arm 
and other side is taped now your face shield as a slit lamp barrier is ready so this is how it looks like uh, we have done the quality and quantity analysis for this also for quality analysis what you have done is we have wrap around the uh, slit lamp with the gauze piece the base is covered with the empty fold tissue paper and uh, original uh, conventional brush shield is covered with the lightweight tissue paper and uh, and we have taken the uh, uh, deodorant solution from the pack why it is taken it has got the uh, vaporizing effect it is mixed with the 2 ml of ink pad solution and empty uh, hand sanitizer solution is put in the low stunge position and press 12 12 12 breaths per minute to stimulate the patient breathing so slit lamp contamination was observed so there are many contamination you can see uh, with the illumination arm side arm the pvc barriers hardly any any protection and base of the slit lamp is also and we have seen the on the observer side uh, the slit lamp is too much contaminated this is the protection from the PVC. We can see the hardly any protection. And same thing we applied with the face shield as a slit lamp barrier. So we almost have a nail protection, nail uh, contamination, very limited contamination of the uh, base of the slit lamp. Minimal contamination at the base of the slit lamp. This is the, but there is a always a chin, uh, chin rest position. There is a slight contamination of the hazard. For the quantity analysis, we have downloaded the image set, image software. So we, it analyzes the particle, total particle coverage area. So total particle coverage here with the face shield, uh, with the original brush shield. So it calculates the total particle and amount of fraction of uh, total coverage area of that shield. So it is only about 0.032%, while our particle area coverage is 0.169%. To conclude, the innovation of face sheet as slit lamp barrier is more effective in preventing contamination. It is inexpensive, require minimal tail, can be installed in any slit lamp, and cleaning of base seal towards the observer side is more important. Some disadvantage of this is small finding missed, like operational cells and failure can be missed. Thank you. So, no, application so, is not. Application. See, whatever is technology, whatever the technology we develop, the bottom line is that we should not able to we should not skip the basic investigation the diagnostic thing so your innovation will not allow application which is the most one of the most important yeah, aspect this is of only for the covid era what we have done is via centers with the uh, candidate examinations so youngsters come so youngster come for the candidate examination so there is a light out i mean we are not in the glaucoma clinic, so this one is no, for no, the no, youngest. No, no, no. Applanation is not for glaucoma clinic. Yeah, I know. Please, I please do not do not compare applanation as part of only glaucoma no, clinic. That understood, sir. So because uh, don't give mess, wrong yeah. message to the other no, juniors. So the innovations are good. Of course, we must innovate in COVID time. I understand. Yeah. But in general, uh, there are several limitations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We go on to our next speaker, Dr. Shafina who is going to be talking on eye respirator, just push, and I request Dr. Shakin Singh to uh, be the discussant for this. Because Dr. Kamaljit Singh is not here. Good morning, all. I will be talking about eye respirator, a novel aspiration tool. In surgical practice, it is important to have a clear and bloodless surgical field. So the need of suction apparatus is important. As uh, ophthalmology as a surgical field have minimum amount of blood loss as in cataract surgery less than 5 ml and in orbital surgery about 75 ml. But the delicacy of the tissue and small amount of the blood is the challenges for aspiration of the blood. So uh, and also uh, pooling of blood and fluid in deep sockets and the bleeding that obscure the view especially in orbital surgeries which need deep tissue access are the challenges faced by ch surgeons. Over years, there are many aspiration tools uh, invented like angiosterometer, manually operated aspiration tool and electric suction pump. But uh, the drawbacks are the suction pressure is very high and also the suction tips are very large which is difficult to maneuver in small surgical field. Aspirator is a 
innovative innovative tool which is uh, meant to seek uh, solve these problems it is an easy do it yourself cost effective and efficient tool for aspiration of small amount of fluid and blood in the operation field and it can be made using recycled and easily available components it is made using a foot pedal a dc adapter a dc water pump an intravenous set a collection bottle and a bottle stand so how does it work it works by direct current which is connected by an adapter and this adapter is connected to a foot pedal which acts as a on and off switch and this foot pedal is again connected into a self priming aspiration motor and the aspiration end of the motor is connected to a tube which is connected to the collection bottle through an opening and which will create a vacuum inside the bottle and the bottle has another opening to which the iv set is connected which will aspirate the fluid and collect inside the collection bottle the other end of the iv set can be used in the surgical field and we also tried uh, using this instrument in the operation theater this is the adapter which is connected to the foot pedal which is controlled by the assisting sister and this is the motor which is connected to the connected to the suction bottle uh, collection bottle this bottle is a used uh, uh, normal saline bottle and we found that uh, the suction apparatus aspirator is effectively aspirating the fluid and blood from the surgical field which improve the view of the surgeon it will which will uh, improve the surgical efficacy and also decrease the time of surgery the advantages are uh, the aspiration can be controlled effectively by foot pedal as and when require uh, apart from the conventional aspiration tool which is permanently on all the time and the opening uh, opening uh, the drip set end is very small and flexible which can be easily maneuvered uh, in the small surgical field and the new iv set can be used for each patient which will avoid the need for uh, uh, sterilization of the whole apparatus for each patient and also avoid cross infection and the entire apparatus can be sterilized by ethylene oxide and it is cost effective the entire apparatus cost less than 1500 uh, rupees and it can be used for cataract surgery especially when there is pooling of fluid uh, during cortex aspiration in deep socket and also for dacryocystorhinostomy dacryocystectomy excision biopsy orbitotomy and evisceration these are my references thank you Uh, not required. Actually, the IV set tube itself will work. Okay. The discussion by Tanya and Dr. Raj. Uh, so, Dr. Tanya, please. She is going to talk about proline suture-assisted modified trabeculectomy for neovascular glaucoma, and the discussion is Dr. Rajul Bari. Okay. So. Good morning, everybody. Today my topic is on proline suture assisted modified trabeculectomy in neovascular glaucoma or novel approach. I have no financial disclosure. All of you know that the neovascular glaucoma is a potentially devastating sequelae of ocular and systemic disease. Various glaucoma surgical procedure, including trabeculectomy, glaucoma denus devices, and cyclodestructive surgery. So the aim of the study to evaluate the outcome of the proline suture assisted modified trabeculectomy in neovascular glaucoma. So what is modified trabeculectomy? It is an innovative new modification of the trabeculectomy with an 80 proline sutures and that was non toxic non absorbable cheap and easily available so the result for the modifications high failure rate of conventional trabeculectomy in neovascular patients and the cost effective compared to the sun surgeon so the modification first triangular scleral flap dissection next construction of the proline bed with an 80 proline sutures like that then making ostium and the pi and after that the three fixed sutures was given with an tangier line on at the apex and the sides of the triangle so the mechanism of action the tainting action of the scleral flap in situ proline sutures facilitating the aqueous outflow and the mechanical barrier action of the proline sutures leading to the less chances of blepharic failure so it was an hospital based prospective interventional studies and the registered the clinical trial registry of india and the 20 patient included in this studies and out of 20 patient 16 are the post pdr groups and the four is a crvo group so inclusion criteria nvg patient uncontrolled on maximal medical management 
treatment and the exclusion criteria NVG patient with a no PL patient with a previous surgical intervention future as a marriage and fractional RD. So now come to the live surgical video. The first conjunctival fondix based flap dissections and after that the cauterization done and then the triangular scalar flap dissections like that. And after that, the mitomycin C 0.02% was given underneath the flap and the conjunctiva. And after that, the copious irrigation done. And then they take a bite from the base of the corner of the triangle and they take it out from the other sides and they take another bite from that side and take it out and another sides and continue it like an S-shaped manner. And the knot was given uh, the entry sides. And after the same as a trabeculectomy procedure, enters with a keratom, then the punching was done, then PI done. And after that, the flap was closed with a 10 0 nylon. So the follow-up, the 18-month follow-up was done at the regular interval. In my studies, I define success as complete when the IP is more than 6, less than 21 without tropical anti-glaucoma medication. And the qualified, the IP 6, more than 21 is tropical anti-glaucoma medication. And the failure means patient breathe surgery and having visual threatening complication. So this is the patient picture, the one, two picture, that is in one month and the 18 month picture of the two patients. So this is the result. So the, in the post period group at the 24 month, complex success rate 62.5% and the qualified 12.5% and failure 25%. And then 24 month CRVO group, complete success 20, uh, 75% and the qualified 25%. And this is then show that there is a significant reduction of the IP. So as per the published literature published in the IGO, the PDR was in, uh, the trabeculectomy in PDR is 50% success rate. And then CRVO patients 75%. But in my studies in a uh, 12 month follow up, the complete success rate was in 75% and the CRVO group is 100%. So the modified trabeculectomy may be considered as a treatment option in NVG patients as an alternative to the trabeculectomy. So these are my references. Thank you. So the logic was that if you put the prolin suture, you are. Tainting actions. So not. Reducing the fibrosis between the two flaps. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Now, the first question that what was the inclusion criteria? And in, have you, in my studies, inclusion criteria that is an, uh, the NVG secondary to the. No, I, no, no, that, no, no. The, well, let me finish my question. That how many hours of new vascularization in angle was allowed? Whether you had considered that part, that whether the patient had how many percentage of, how many clock hours of sinicias? or not in into the including in the study because that would have a direct no, direct no. bearing on the success if there's more cyanic in the superior angle the trap has a higher failure rate so if you have not included that then you must include that part in your in, uh, analysis and then reanalyze and see what happens second uh, for, especially for glaucoma success rate World Glaucoma Association has come out with the consensus 11 number guideline, which very clearly mentions that how you should analyze the success of glaucoma surgery. So 21 is very arbitrary. We all know that. So do not use 21 as a success criteria. So read that book, reanalyze because 21 is very arbitrary. Less than 20%, less than 30% or more than 30%. That is a better way of analyzing. So the complete and qualified success both will completely change whether how many percentage reduction you have achieved. Okay, so the thought process, I'm, I'm, it's really good that proline because it will uh, a give a little process. gap between the two flaps and will reduce the fibrosis. Yeah. That logic, I, I'm, I'm, it's really good. But other part, mm. the <laughs> statistical part, the inclusion part, that need to be properly studied. So you cannot use one data and in directly transferred into your data. So I don't know IGO article about 75 to 100%, uh, 50 and 75%, but the uh, most of the studies have shown very clearly that if you have a more cyanica in the superior angle, the trap fails much more. So even in open uh, NVG patient, if the superior angle is open, then trap is a better success rate. So you must analyze in a, that angle. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, nice presentation.
and I think uh, there's one speaker who had could not come, so everybody uh, else has been uh, uh, has spoken and discussed well. Thank you very much, judges, for being there well on time. Huh? Yes, we have time for a group photograph. So I request the judges to come up on the tires. Thank you so much for running it so well on time that a group photograph intelligence is possible. All the speakers can also come up for the group photograph.